Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, welcome to lecture number two on operations planning and scheduling. Today we are going to start module one, that is demand forecasting. Uh, it's a big topic and it's an important topic. Uh, and many of the following uh, modules and topics that we will discuss are directly related to this topic. So I have divided it into three parts. In part one, we will introduce uh, demand forecasting, what it is and what are the characteristics of demand forecasting. And specifically, we will focus on forecast accuracy or forecast error, how we can calculate it and what are different measures of forecast error and uh, what do they uh, show us. Learning objectives of this part one are to differentiate between independent demand and dependent demand. These are two types of demand in any organization. You should be able to understand the importance of demand forecasting for any business. And we will discuss uh, some uh, general characteristics of demand forecast. So whatever is the business environment and whatever is the method of forecasting, we have some general characteristics of every forecast in every situation so you should be able to understand that and then we will uh, learn to use three measures of forecast accuracy that is mean absolute deviation mean squared error and mean absolute percent error formally forecasting is the business function that attempts to predict sales and use of products so that they can be purchased or manufactured in appropriate quantities in advance. So demand forecasting is forecasting the demand for a particular good, component or service. Now depending upon the manufacturing environments, the demand that we are forecasting uh, would be a different unit. For example, in make to stock environment, we, we are talking about the demand of finished product. In an assemble to order environment, we might be forecasting and the number of sub assemblies and components to build in advance so that we can um, fulfill customer requirements. So there are two types of demand. One is independent demand. That is the demand of an item that is unrelated to the demand for other items. So demand of finished goods is an example of independent demand. So just keep in mind that uh, finished goods is just an example of independent demand. There are other examples as well that we will look into later. But at the moment, the more relevant example is the demand of finished goods. The second type of demand is dependent demand. Demand that is directly related to or derived from the bill of material. So I will just explain in the next slide what is a bill of material. So this demand is dependent upon the bill of material structure for other items or end products. So it is derived or calculated. So this topic forecasting is focused on independent demand. Classical example is of course the demand of finished goods, but there are other examples as well. Dependent demand can be calculated from the forecast using uh, what we call material requirements planning. So that is one of the topics in our course that we will discuss. So let's take, a, take an example. So in this case, A is the finished product. So its demand is the independent demand. So for example, this is a ceiling fan, let's suppose. So it has different components. So for example, it may have um, wings, each ceiling fan has three wings, it has, it requires a rod, it has some studs and nuts and so on. So their demand will be the dependent demand. So in this hypothetical example, this final product A requires one B, one sub-assembly B, and two sub-assembly C. And each B requires two components D and one E, and each C requires one D. So these B, C, D, and E are the sub-assemblies and components and their number depends upon the number of A that we have forecast. So in this module, we are talking about 
forecasting the demand for these final products and the demand for b c d and e or sub assemblies or components can be calculated depending upon the number of a's that are required and number of each component that is required for each a so we can simply multiply to find the demand for the components and sub assemblies now in in forecasting you have to be aware with a different types of demand patterns or different types of uh, variation in the data for demand so one of the variations is random variations these are residual variation that re remain after all other behaviors have been accounted for so these are the variation in the data that are natural demand for any component is never constant it changes from time to time so we cannot really uh, find the reason for the change because every natural phenomena has some random variation so it's hard to predict the cause of those variations the second type of variation is trend it refers to a long term upward or downward movement in the data so just like a line similar to straight line so that is trend seasonality refers to short term fairly regular variations generally related to factors such as the calendar or time of day so seasonality could relate to for example literal seasons summer winter etc it could relate to a certain uh, month in the year it was certain day in the uh, in the month as well so demand for certain items might be high at the weekend than during the weekdays or even seasonality could be a certain time in the day so for example demand for the food might be high during evening or night than it is in the morning and finally we have cycles they are wave like variations of more than one year's duration and uh, uh, these are often related to a variety of economic political and even agricultural conditions so generally the people in the field of economics experts of economics actually make forecasts for more than one year so in this course we were more concerned with the random variations trend uh, or Uh, uh, trend and seasonality. So these three types of variations will be our focus in this topic of demand forecasting. So you can get a fair idea of uh, these uh, variations in the demand from this figure. So if the demand is as a whole increasing as this, uh, as in this figure A, so as a whole there is an increasing trend. of course there are some random variations but as a whole the demand for this item is increasing so this is a linear trend it could be other way around as well so it could be something like this as well so if you are aware of product life cycle so generally during uh, initial phases of product life cycle we have an increasing trend if the if the product launch was successful and during the later stages of a product life we have a decreasing trend uh i will come to the uh, uh, cyclic variations later the second type of variation we have is the seasonal variation so after a certain uh, specified duration of time we have a spike in the demand then the demand is uh, stabilized then after uh, same amount of time we have again increase in the demand and this pattern repeats so just like literal seasons or certain months of the year or certain days in the month or certain time of the day so the the season repeats at least once a year so that should be kept in mind at least once a year it could be more than once a year as well so in this case in figure d we have a combination of trend with Uh, seasonal patterns so there is an increasing trend as well as uh, seasonal pattern in this case so this could be a product that is seasonal in nature but it is newly launched product for example it could be a product related to summer but it's a new product new variant so as a whole its demand is increasing but specifically the demand is high during summer so it could be product like this so new product a successful product but by nature its demand is high in certain uh, seasons and you can of course see the random variations in all these examples so there are 
small variation from time to time, so they are random variation. The cycle in shape is very similar to season, but the time span is high. So it spans over a few years. A season, uh, sorry, a cycle spans few years. So just because of recession for a few years, the demand for a product may decrease or after recovery from recession, it may increase. So it, it spans over a few years, but season repeats itself at least once a year. So we will be initially talking about the forecasting methods that focus only on random variation, and then we will move on to address seasonality as well as trend. So you can get the same idea from this figure as well. So this product has fairly low demand during, uh, during summer. You can see from April to September, the demand is low and it has a very high demand during uh, winter. So it seems to be a, a product that has high sales during winter. And of course, you can notice a random variations from period to period as well. So this is also, this figure is also showing seasonal pattern of demand. These are very important characteristics of forecasts. So first one is that forecasts are generally wrong. We cannot exactly forecast the demand. So we should include a mayor of forecast error. So whenever we are talking about a forecast, we do assign a mayor of error. So we have this forecast with this much error. Forecasts are more accurate for groups than for single items. So if we are forecasting, for example, for uh, air conditioners for the next summer that will be more accurate instead of forecasting for uh, air conditioners of specific capacity for air conditioners of 110 and single items individual items the forecast is less accurate than for group of items so if we are forecasting for the cars that our company is making that might be more accurate than forecasting for each model of the car Forecasts of near-term demand are more accurate than long-term forecasts. So forecasts for the next one week will be more accurate than and the forecast for the uh, next month or the forecast for the next month will be more accurate than and the forecast for the next quarter and so on. Finally, in general, the farther up the supply chain a company is, the greater is the distortion of information it receives. So, if my company is the original equipment manufacturer, then it has, for example, this is the manufacturer. So it has suppliers, then its suppliers have, have their suppliers, level two suppliers. And then of course they might have their suppliers. So the more we move from the central organization of the supply chain, the less accurate will be the forecast or more uh, distorted will be the demand information and it could be on the other side as well. So we, we might have series of uh, distributors on the other side as well. So the more away we move from the source of information about the demand, the more will be the distortion in that demand and that is called a bullwhip effect. Bullwhip effect. So the Forecasts are the basis for many planning decisions in any supply chain. They are used for both push processes and pull processes. So if we know the forecast, we can properly schedule the production. We can decide the inventory levels. We can plan the production at the aggregate level. Based on the demand in, in certain period, we can allocate sales force. We can decide whether we have to go for the promotion of the products or not. When we have to introduce the new products, much investment we, do we need in new plant or equipment, how much, how much budget we need and how much workforce and so on. So all these decisions directly or indirectly depend upon how much we are going to make or sell. So that is what we come to know through forecasting. And I show you this figure in the last lecture. So just I want to emphasize here that forecasting is one of the imports to sales and operations planning. And as we will move on, to discuss the topics further, we will see that forecasting is also very important input to master production schedule. So depending upon the level of planning, we need certain type of forecast. 
These two terms are very important to be kept in mind. One is the forecast horizon. So that is the period of time into the future for which a forecast is prepared. So we are forecasting for next one quarter or one year or whatever is the span of time. So that is forecast horizon. Forecast interval or forecast period is the time unit for which forecasts are prepared, such as week, month or quarter. So, for example, if you are forecasting for the next six months, but we are forecasting on monthly basis. So the uh, forecast horizon will be six months, but we will be forecasting for each month. So I hope it is clear. So from where do we get information for making forecasts? So the information can come from different departments, from demand management, if there is a separate department for that. It, it can come from sales, of course. Sales and marketing are two major sources of uh, demand forecast. It can come from CRM. CRM is also one of the modules in some of the ERP softwares. So we can uh, use data mining or the pattern of previous demand to, to forecast for the future. And we can get information from distribution centers and directly from customers as well. So depending upon the type of business, the forecast data can come from different sources. It could, it could come from one source or of course from a combination of sources. And then we, we can reconcile or combine those, that, that information to make a final forecast. So this was an introduction to demand forecasting some terminology, some characteristics of forecast. So if you have any question, now you can ask.